microphone. Okay, there we go. Morning. Good morning. For those who don't know Craig, this is Craig. And I'm over at Craig's place. And yeah, we're hanging out. And we're in Matthew somewhere. <laughs> Let's see here. Ba -ba -ba oh, okay. So. Uh, you teach out a New King James? Or I do teach out a New King James. There we go. So, let's see here. I'll give you guys time to, to hop on. It's always one of those fun... Facebook always makes things interesting. All right, so, Matthew, <coughs> chapter 24, verse 36 on to... We'll figure out how far we're going. So, it says in verse 36, But of that day and hour no one knows, not even the angels of heaven but my father only. But as in the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and did not know until the flood came and took them all away. So also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Then... Two men will be in the field. One will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken and the other left. Watch, therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. But know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore, you also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. So, here we have another section of the Olivet Discourse. And I, looking backwards, verses 3 to 14, I mentioned really seems to be a picture of the first half of the tribulation. We, we see verses 4 through 14 lining up with the seal judgments. Uh, verse 14 even looks like the 144,000, this group that are going to be out there preaching the gospel. And then verses 15 to 28, Jesus speaks of the great tribulation, the second half. And then 29 down to 31, he talks about his return. The end of the great tribulation, he returns and gathers up all the believers on the earth to march on into that millennial kingdom. And so we then did the 32 to 35, where he backs up and starts talking about the parable of the fig tree. You guys know what it looks like when it's about to bear fruit? Well, here's all the signs. Watch out for when this time is coming. So he kind of chronologically walks you through the end times, then backs up and says, now here are the signs that is coming. But, so 36, I'm just going to assume that's our, our, our word, um, Allah there, or the however, but I'm assuming, I didn't have my Greek in front of me, but it, it, it's a transition now. So he's saying, you need to pay attention to the signs. When you see the fig tree coming, it's getting ripe. But then you need to know that no one knows the day or hour. Now, I'm going to look at a few of these words here in a second, but here's just a thought, is I struggle um one thing with a post-tribulational view of the rapture that, that when they when they try and kind of join the the second coming of Christ with the rapture of the church that's really where people end up with that stance where they if they think Christians are going to go through the tribulation and be raptured at the end where he zips us up into the air and then we all get whiplash and come back down with Jesus you know wah, 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 wah. It, the idea is is that um, at the three and a half year mark uh, there's no really, uh, there is no sign for the start of the seven years that is, would be so definable and noticeable. You could say, ah, the seven year mark has started. But at the three and a half year mark, when the Antichrist goes into the temple to be worshipped as God, which we read about in 15 to 28, Daniel chapter 9 and 11 and 12, well, now you know there's a three and a half year countdown. You know for a fact. I mean, they, they, what do they say? 42 months, 1260 days. They say it in like every measurement of time you can go by 
Time times half a times, three and a half years. I mean, middle of the week. And so if the coming of Jesus being talked about here in verses 36 on down is the second coming, well, man can know that hour. Because if we make it to the middle of the tribulation, then it's a three and a half year countdown. You can start your clocks and you should know when the second coming is going to be. So if it's a time or an event where we can't know the time or hour, it has to be a separate event. And so he's saying now the season leading up to this event is like the days of Noah. And notice it's just they were eating, drinking, marrying, giving in marriage. And, and in a sense, it's just picturing day-to-day -day life. And other times you hear about the seasons of Lot and whatnot, talking about the immorality. But I think here he's just talking about with Noah, it was day-to-day -day life. It was, you know, they were just going on, <clears throat> getting married. You know, I mean, if you, and actually, this was a conversation. Enrique, I don't know if you're on right now. We were just talking about this with some of our young single people from the church about how, you know, if there was only three years left, Enrique was like, I wouldn't even worry about getting married if I knew there was only three years left. I told him if I knew there was three years left, I'd definitely get married because there's three whole years you can be married. But the point is, is like, yeah, if the time is that short, right, um, we might be living differently. But with Noah and like the day and age we live in now, people are just going on like, like you're going to live forever. And in some ways that's okay. In the sense of like, you know, I have a retirement plan. <laughs> I, I have plans for my children to be raised. And on the flip side, we're living like we're on borrowed time, knowing that the Son of Man could come at any hour. Now it says in verse 39, how they didn't know what was going on and then they took them all away. So in verse 39, because people sometimes notice that people are taken in verses 40 and 41. People are taken in verses 39. The catch, oh, there we go. Yep, Enrique's with us. <laughs> is in verse 39, it's a different Greek word for being taken. Took them all away is airo. And it's a word that actually describes being carried off for judgment. Like you're being taken off for, and that's what happened in the flood, is the people were carried away by the waters. But in 40 and 41, this is the same words that Luke uses in the, whatever, the pre-sermon to the Olivet Discourse in Luke 21. It's paralambano. Now, para, we get like parallel from. It means to be alongside. And lambano is the word to lift up. We have other words we use with, with that word, to, to carry. And so the word literally means to take alongside yourself, to take with you. Paralambano. And so in verses 40 and 41, two men will be in the field. One will be taken, the other left. 41, two women will be grinding the mill. One will be taken, one will be left. Now, I mentioned the other day how even amongst the theologians in the same camp, there's differences of opinions. And honestly, one of the, the greatest minds I know when it comes to um, the it, eschatology, end time study, two guys. I, I think I can speak for both. John Walvoord and I know Tommy Ice being another one. They view this differently than I do. And I know even amongst Calvary pastors, I've seen this taught two different ways. And I'll give you both views and then my view is the right one. But Here's the catch is some people think this is speaking of the end times judgment at the end of the seven years, the separation of the sheep and the goats. And in this case, it'd be the goats are taken. And that's where they tie it into the Noah line, because in Noah, the people taken were judged. But it's a different word here. And here's one of the things is taking Jesus fairly literally here, that two people will be together, one taken, one left. If this is the end of the seven years of tribulation. And if you've ever watched, I mean, watch a movie, right? Most of the movies actually are a semi mockery of the end times, but I mean, you know, they paint all these pictures, but no matter what, if you know what the end times are gonna be like, hell on earth with the antichrist and his forces hunting Christians, do you really think there's gonna be two men, a believer and an unbeliever just working together in, a, in the field? 
Are there going to be a believing and unbelieving person working at the mill, grinding? And Luke even mentions two in bed. Do you think at the end of the tribulation, and remember this is the end of the seven years, so if this is talking about the sheep and the goats, this is happening after the second coming of Christ. Like it's happening right then. It's happening after every one of the judgments, the earthquakes, the 70 pound hailstones. Are people going to be two to bed, a believer and a number? I just have a hard time seeing that. And I was listening to, to Dr. Ice on the subject <clears throat> not long ago. And I mean, he's got his, his opinions. He believes that uh, Jesus did not reveal anything about the rapture until John 14, after Judas left the group, then Jesus began to reveal those things. It's it's an interesting like it's an interesting viewpoint, but at the same time, there's no scripture saying you know Jesus did not reveal the end times until a certain point. So I think it is talking about the rapture of the church because only right now, as people are marrying and giving in marriage, <coughs> eating and drinking, going on daily life. Could I imagine a believer and an unbeliever in the field, at the mill, or even in bed together, and then one is taken and the other is left behind? Also, if it's the second coming, like I said, once the Antichrist goes into the temple, abomination of desolation, it's three and a half years. You can actually map that out on a calendar. But right now, Jesus coming back for his church, no man can know the day or the hour. Could be now. You always wish, right? And so, here's the catch. The last couple of verses. The stuff that actually really matters is the application. We know this, right? That if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Right? But, therefore the Son of Man be ready... Therefore, you also, sorry, be ready for the Son of Man is coming at the hour you do not expect. In short, if a thief was coming and you knew they were coming, you'd be prepared. Well, since you don't know what time a thief comes, the only thing you can do is be prepared. Got an email last week or so. David, if you're on, you might know. Um, there's been break-ins at churches in the Lower Valley and in the Grandview area. So we decided to finally go forward. We talked about a security system for a long time. We've had the bid and had everything lined up. We've just been kind of waiting on like, okay, do we actually go forward and get the security system installed? And we decided to go for it. Why? Well, because security systems are useless until you get broken into. And then all of a sudden you're like, ah, thankfully we had this thing. Or in retrospect, man. I wish we had a camera. Anyone else but like, you get stuff stolen from you and you just wish, like if I had a camera and I could have seen those punks. Do you know someone stole one of our flower baskets from the front of the church last week? There's a special place in hell for people who steal flower baskets. Okay, but the point is, is that it'd be great if there was a camera. If there was a great, I wish we could have caught the person. I wish we could have stopped the person. Yeah. Every time you get broken into and stolen from by a thief, it's always retrospect, like, if only. Well, you can prepare <coughs> and get a security system, get some cameras, whatever it is, if you want to be ready to catch a thief. Now, more importantly than that is Jesus' return. It's when Jesus comes back and all bets are off. Every person you've ever wanted to share the gospel with you're out of time. Everything you wanted to do for the Lord, you're out of time. Honestly, everything you wanted to do with your spouse and with your kids, you're out of time. And so when Paul writes the Ephesians and talks about walking circumspectly, which is fancy talk for just, like I like to tell people, to be intentional with your time. Even last Sunday we talked a little bit about this where it was just like, what is stopping you? Are you afraid? Do you not like being uncomfortable? Like the things that stop us from doing the things that we know God is calling us to do. But at the end of the day, be intentional. If you're going to miss church, be intentional. Know why you're missing church. If you're going to miss the prayer meeting or miss the midweek or whatever it is at your church, like why are you missing it? 
No, understand, like, why are you spending the time you spend the way you spend it? Why are you going and doing these things? And a lot of times people just don't think about it. We don't realize, like, huh, I never really thought about that I'm wasting blood-bought time. And Paul even calls the days evil in that verse. Redeeming the time. Walking circumspectly, redeeming the time for the days are evil. And, you know, the days we live in are evil. And wasted time is somewhat evil too. And We've all got to have time to relax, time to be with family, but at the same time, we've got to be out sharing the gospel. We have to be out pouring into the disciples who are behind us as we, you know, we get poured into and then we pour into others because we don't know the day and the hour that Jesus is coming. And so if you have loved ones who haven't received the gospel, you don't know how much time you have left. And so redeem it. Use your time wisely. Use your time intentionally because you don't know the day or the hour that the Lord is coming. So there you go. How was that? That was awesome. I did a good job? Okay. Yes, you did. Thank you. Uh, hey, I'll give a plug for those of my friends who are still watching. So Craig helps run Calvary Chapel of the Air Facebook group. I post these videos in there every day but if you guys like I know some of you guys watch Dallas like every morning too go check out Calvary Chapel of the Air and there's all sorts of Bible teachers posting stuff on there all the time so if you got a lot of free time and you love going through Bible studies Penfilio thinking of you sir go check out Calvary Chapel of the Air and there's tons of cool stuff on there that's how we met and here we are yeah so awesome you guys take care and I should be seeing you bright and early tomorrow morning. Adios. I gotta get it to my camera. It's a long run stretch. <laughs>